Welcome everyone um, to the keynote session with Dr. David Weinberger. I'm Aisha Piotti, the co-founder and managing partner of Red Horizon. Uh, before we start, just as a reminder to the audience, David's keynote will last about 35 minutes, after which we will open the floor for a short Q&A session. So please do post your questions in the chat and we'll try to answer as many as possible during the allocated time. David has an impressive resume, so I'll try to do my best now to introduce him to you. David has written five books about the effect of the internet on our lives, on our businesses, and on our ideas. His latest book, Everyday Chaos, is about how machine learning is changing how we think about our chaotic world. He has also written for a wide range of publications, including the Scientific American and the Harvard Business Review. David has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Toronto and has long been closely affiliated with Harvard's Berkman Klein Center. He has also been a fellow at Harvard's Shortstein Center on Media, Politics and Public Policy, a Franklin Fellow at the US State Department and an advisor to high tech companies and presidential campaigns. David, it is my great pleasure and honor to have you with us today. So without any further delay, I would like to pass the floor to David Weinberger. Thank you so much for, for having me. It's, it's, it's uh, my honor. <laughs> I sound very good on paper, but we'll, <laughs> we'll just see about that. So um, I want to, uh, I'm going to take over the screen. There we go. Okay, um, so I want to uh, talk today um, about um, machine learning and some of its uh, implications. Uh, my main aim is to try to provide a perhaps a different, uh, at least somewhat different framing of the topic for regulators. Um, so th the aim overall uh, of this talk is to um, embrace the promise of unknowing. That is the, the, the real power of uh, recognizing how little we know and how little we can manage. And this is an order uh, to enable us to regulate AI for maximum benefit. Um, because I, one of my premises is that there is tremendous opportunity in this new technology. Um, and uh, finally, I am assuming that we are all well aware of the issues with AI in terms of its being biased, the problems with accountability, lack of transparency, and that these are issues that we all take very, very seriously. And I do too. And I say this because I'm not going to talk about them very much. I assume that we are all pretty much in agreement that these are very important issues. In fact, they have caused something of what I would think of as an ethical panic in uh, much of the world's population and with, with good cause. This, this is in many ways a very frightening technology. I don't want to talk much about that. I do want to talk about what I am rather pretentiously calling a metaphysical panic that I think is underneath the ethical panic. So I don't have to tell you, you know, the basics of how machine learning works. Uh, for my way of talking about the framing, what's important is that the normal way of programming where a developer models a, um, a, a domain in terms of the factors and the what we know about the relationships among those factors, all of that gets dropped in machine learning where all of this turns simply into data uh, reflecting those factors without generally any information about what we already know about how they connect. It's all just data. It is just numbers, meaningless numbers. All the meaning gets stripped out of it when the, when the uh, system is being trained on the data. Now, the data it's being trained on uh, is we've provided it because of a sense of meaning, but to the machine, it's just big piles of numbers, which seems like it should not result in anything interesting, but we know that it, it does. Um, we know that it results in, in, in models that can be so, so, so complex that we can't understand them uh, sometimes often in full, sometimes um, in part, and sometimes uh, particular uh, outcomes. We just can't figure out, at least at this point, how the machine came up with them. But it was based upon some set of, of correlations that it discovered among the data, correlations that may be strong, weak, 
spurious. And the result is the natural state for machine learning is a black box because it doesn't care. It doesn't start with human understandable stuff, just numbers. And it results in a, a box that if it works, outputs good, useful results without having to worry about whether it makes sense to us. This is not to say they have to stay black boxes, but that's where their natural state. They start as a black box, unconstrained by human meaning. And as a result, as we all know already, and certainly within a few years, uh, you will be going to your doctor for your checkup, and the doctor will say, everything looks good, uh, but there's a 72% chance you'll develop type 2 diabetes in five years, and you're going to say, no, that can't be. I, I am young, I'm healthy, I exercise, I eat well, there's no history of diabetes in my family. Why on earth does do you think I'm going to have a 72% chance of getting diabetes? And your doctor is going to say, well, uh, I don't know. Um, this is the result of our deep patient machine learning system that's been trained on 700,000 patient records, 500 data points in each. And we literally can't figure out in this case how it's doing its diabetes predictions, but we have uh, through experiment and experience, we've discovered that if it says a 72% chance, there's a 72% chance that it's right. I mean, so, it's up to you. What, what do you want to do about it? We can ignore it. We can you know, uh, take some prevent. What do you want to do? And that's the conversation we're going to be having more and more, and obviously not just in medicine. Well, this gives natural rise to a cri de coeur that uh, we don't know how it works. We don't know how it works, but we don't know how it works, which is true and very disturbing for, this is where the ethical concerns arise, one of the places anyway. We don't know how it works. We can't judge how it came up with its decisions. We thus cannot, it seems, investigate whether these decisions are biased um, or, or not. Um, but there's a part of that sentence that I think is actually behind the, the fear that we have that this total sentence engenders, which is we don't know how it works, but really important, it works. We don't know how, but it works. And the fact that it works by finding correlations in complex networks and uh, weighted networks in which uh, various uh, relationships, uh, which may be causal, maybe not, but their correlations result in um, predictions that are more accurate than we were able to do before. And we only use the machine learning system when we think that's the case. That tells us something about how the world works because ultimately the black box is not simply the machine learning system. The black box is the world. The world is way, way more complex and inexplicable than any machine learning system ever can be by necessity. The machine learning systems work because they reflect, they do, are a better representation, a more useful and more accurate representation of the overwhelming, immense, impossibly complex set of relationships that constitute the world that we live in. And so I think this has brought us to a Copernican, uh, a Copernican mo moment, which I, I think is a really useful and important one in which we humans take the next step in, in our evolution, or the evolution of our thought, and recognize just how little of the world we can manage and how impossibly complex it is, how far it uh, exceeds our capacity. And this is a huge moment because, at least in the West, the West's history, philosophical, intellectual history, has been premised on the idea, until very recently, that humans are the rational animals, that we are the ones who are, for one reason or another, have been given the ability to understand something about the world, the big broad principles that manage it. And it's true, we can understand those, but those turn out not to be enough. We now are at the point where we have technology that enables us to benefit, benefit from acknowledging that the world is more complex than our brains can manage. But the technology that we have created, flawed and, and, and dangerous as it is, is able to make better predictions than we can because it is better able to deal with the immense complexity. And our first instinct, very understandably and quite properly in many ways, is to say, well, ah, we want transparency. This is what we need to know how these things work. We want transparency. And as I will discuss, uh, frequently that makes sense, but to, to want transparent systems is to make it sound as 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure who could, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. I, I'm really sorry. Um, <sighs> okay, so I'm going to go back to, I hope, go back to my presentation. This is more or less the definition yeah. of a problem. You okay, so, okay. Perfect. Well, let's just, I'm just going to have to start all over if that's okay. Nah. Okay, so let me go back one slide. Um, we want transparency. It's understandable. We act as if transparency, however, too often, I think, we, we assume that it's sort of an ontological state of, of a system. What we really want are explanations, a totally reasonable uh, desire. Doesn't mean it can be met, but it's totally reasonable. So let's talk about explanations uh, for a minute. Um, so let's say you are on, you're driving and you're on a back road because you were late and you took it as a shortcut um, and uh, you get a flat tire. And so of course you want to know what happened. You're looking for an explanation and there it is, you find it. There's a, there's a nail. That's an explanation. It's a very common sort of explanation called a sine qua non. Um, there but for the nail. If there hadn't been a nail, I wouldn't have gotten a flat. Very true, very useful. I'm certainly not going to argue against it, but I do want to point out that it's not the only sine qua non in this scenario. So for example, if you hadn't been late, you wouldn't have taken the back road, no flat tire. If you, you swerved for a rabbit and that's why you hit the, hit the nail, had you not, no, uh, no flat. If metal were softer than rubber, no flat. If uh, pointy things didn't penetrate better, no flat. If humans didn't care about getting places and, or car companies had given us steel wheels, no flat. If gravity hadn't been in effect, no flat. And if space aliens hadn't failed to harvest our surface iron because they are a rust-based uh, metabolism, no flat. Everything had to happen for you to get that flat. They are all sin sine qua nons. Everything is a sine qua non. So why do we pick the nail as the explanation. Clearly the right thing to do, but why is this the right explanation? The answer is really, really clear. It's because in this scenario, the nail is the one thing we can change. We can't go back in time and, and decide, well, we'll hit the rabbit this time. We can't suspend the law of gravity. The nail is the one thing we can change. And so that becomes the explanation. The point of which is explanations are not a feature of the landscape. They are a tool that we use when we need to. They're like the, the little, like a lantern in, in, in a forest when we're trying to look at something or find our way. We turn it on for a while. It's, it's a tool, but the fundamental landscape is not one that has to do with explanations. The world does not owe us an explanation. And if it gave us one, we wouldn't understand it. Explanations are tools. Transparency is a forensic tool. It is, and so to demand transparency as if it were a state of the object itself is, I think, to make a sort of category mistake. We want transparency when we need it. It's one of the tools that we can use. And in fact, it's not even, I think everybody here understands this, it's not even a single tool. So if you take this as a crude map of the development of a machine learning system, uh, there are various places where we will want an explanation, where we will want transparency. Um, but depending on where you are applying it, it will change radically in terms of what tools you want to use, uh, the role of those tools, the importance of those tools, uh, how, how much certainty you need about the transparency. If it's at the beginning of the process where the goals of the machine learning system are being established, then you have one type of question about the goals and the priorities and who gets, really importantly, who gets to participate. If it's about uh, how you are training the system, then you've got probably more technical questions about uh, that you want explanations for, about algorithms, how many layers, uh, what the loss function is, and so forth. So transparency is not a property of, of things. It's a tool, and it's a hugely complex. Even just lumping them all under transparency is uh, problematic. But uh, so we can't, I don't think, uh, expect that black box systems are going to always be always transparent or even transparent in the ways that we would like them to be to solve particular problems. But we have already, we have many, many decades and centuries of regulating um, products that we don't fully understand. We have used aspirin for over 4,000 years, willow bark, for over 4,000 years. And it's only in the past 100 years, in fact, less than that, that we've understood how aspirin works, yet we've still been able to use it successfully and even to regulate it successfully. So we have a lot of experience as a culture or as cultures doing this. 
And part uh, some of the good news is that we're making tremendous progress technically, as I'm sure uh, many, if not all of you know, in, in coming up with tools that help us make uh, black boxes um, explicable, uh, at least somewhat transparent in at least some of their areas. We have tools that allow us to explore a model to see what um, features are, are affecting the outcomes. We have uh, processes like counterfactuals that allow us to test whether a model is biased without having to know exactly how it works. There are efforts like that from uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology to create um, nutritional labels, but for data sets. Um, there's tons and tons and tons more of really great research going on to help us get the sorts of forensic explanations that we need. But I think we should assume, at least for now, that black that machine learning systems are going to remain black boxes uh, for the foreseeable future. They're going to get more and more complex uh, and harder to interpret, even as our tools get better. At, at helping us with this. And that's, a, you know, that's, that's sort of the natural state of a black box, right? Is to be, uh, of a machine learning system is to be a black box. So I wanna look at two ways of approaching this, uh, both of which are familiar to you. Um, uh, one is to look at outcomes and to regulate those. Another is to regulate the application of principles. And I'm, what a, uh, so this is in effect a utilitarian or consequentialist approach versus a deontological one. Um, both of looking at both of these, each of these leads to the same conclusion that there are overwhelming issues of scale and complexity in trying to apply either of these approaches. Which isn't to say we shouldn't do it, but um, okay. So let's look first at outcomes, which means looking at values. So let's say you are the CEO of, a, of an autonomous vehicle company and you gather your managers and we hope people who are outside of your organization as well, people who may be affected by the rise of, excuse me, of autonomous vehicles, you gather them and you ask them, let's just put up on a whiteboard all the things we would like our cars to support? What are the values? What are we aiming for? What should we be optimizing it for? And very quickly, a couple dozen um, different sorts of values will go up on the blackboard. And everybody will agree that the, the one in the upper left, fatalities, is the most important one. We can all agree on that. We want fewer deaths, highway deaths. And after that, it gets, it gets harder. There are all of these uh, benefits uh, that could be obtained, that the system could be optimized for, but it turns out, so this looks very promising and great and everybody's happy, but it turns out that these values, of course, are not in all consistent. So if you want to drive down fatalities, it may well be that you want to drive down, uh, you want to regulate the speed at which these cars go, which means you're now giving up some of the benefit of getting somebody from point A to point B in the shortest time. Um, that's a trade-off. Uh, and uh, fatality, drive down fatalities, you may want the system to break at the slightest hint that there may be a pedestrian in the road. You want it to slam on the brakes and that's going to affect uh, personal comfort. I'm not saying it's not the right trade-off. I'm just saying it's a trade-off. And likewise, shortest time to destination may make it impossible to achieve maximal environmental savings benefits. And if you go for, if you want your car to be really, really, really green, it may be that it's going to cost more. So you lose affordability and so so on. You end up not even with a hierarchy, a pyramid of, of values, of optimizations. You end up with a conflicting net, a balanced network, a weighted network of, of benefits. These, these trade-offs are extremely important and extremely difficult to, to uh, come up with, to decide on. And with machine learning, you have to do it at a, a level of precision that we are humans are not really comfortable with, uh, but that drives really important conversations. And these gives rise to places where regulation makes, uh, I think, in my opinion, uh, you know, don't think this is controversial. You can regulate what the car companies are optimizing for. It would be perfectly reasonable to say, no, environmental savings, that's more important than personal comfort or whatever. Uh, and then you can insist on getting metrics about how the the cars are doing in achieving those optimizations. Um, and that will presumably, you know, address some of the issues. But that's too simple. 
It's already too complex, but it's too simple because that will optimize cars perhaps. But we're not just looking at optimizing cars. That would be to miss an opportunity because there are going to be uh, networks of cars, presumably. It seems to me at least quite likely. And I hope that cars will be forming transient networks on the highways so that your own car will literally be able to look over the highway, uh, over the horizon, but the, because the car that is over the horizon will be sending back information. But this also means that cars can and should coordinate in order to achieve maximal social benefit. Or even just in a particular, you know, a, a child wanders out into the middle of the road, the cars can communicate and make um, optimized decisions about routing around it. Car A says, I'll go left if you go right. And car B says, I'll go right if car C go, and so forth. And they can route around it. We want, we want the net, we could optimize the cars individually but still, if, if they are each pursuing their own optimization, so one car company is proud to make the fast car, and another one is proud to make the green car, and another is proud to make the safe car, and the other is proud to make the, the inexpensive car, they're they will be optimized for different things, and the network may lose the opportunity for overall system optimization. This is, gets really, really hard, but I would hate to lose that, that possibility. So to optimize, uh, to, to optimize and regulate outcomes, I think requires humans being ex not just uh, explicit about what values we want, but precise enough that a machine learning system, which is simply a statistical engine, is able to operate on them. Um, it means having many, many difficult human arguments because we do not agree about the values. That is a, we've been able to get by somewhat with both of these because we haven't ha dealt with a technology that requires such precision. So now let's talk about fairness um, as a type of um, principle-based approach. Um, so it is well known and I, and I, uh, I hope understood that AI has much to learn from fairness about fairness. Right? That's really important, but again, it's because it's so well known, I'm not gonna talk uh, about that because I think it's also the case that fairness has much to learn from AI, from machine learning. So one can ask why fairness is the term that's used in moral discussions so frequently about um, AI, because it's not a term that has a lot of presence in, in Western philosophy, which prefers to talk about uh, justice and morality and the good and things like that. And fairness has been considered to be um, sort of like folk medicine that uh, medical professionals don't take all that seriously. But now fairness is the term that's being used. Um, and I think in part it's because fairness is simple. But fairness is a really simple concept. And the standard example, I know you all know what fairness is, but <laughs> the standard example uh, is um, giving cookies to kids. So this looks unfair because it's an unequal number of cookies. But if I were to tell you that the child on the left has diabetes and thus shouldn't have much sugar and the child on the right made a deal with his parents that he would get cookies for doing more chores because it's a proper capitalist family, then it doesn't look nearly as unfair. And that's because fairness is simply uh, the same treatment is given to humans unless there is a relevant difference. And if I were to say to you, no, the unequal distribution is due to the skin color of the child on the left, that would clearly be an irrelevant difference. And this would instantly be perceived correctly as a wildly unfair distribution. Right, so it's a very, very simple principle, but it's not going to stay that way. So I want to use example, an example of an AI system, machine learning system that is actually in use, which concerns me. I'm not crazy about this use of machine learning, but nevertheless. And everything I'm about to say is hypothetical and made up, all of the uh, examples I'm about to give you. So it's a system for sorting through job applications. Its job is to winnow them down to a handful of uh, people who should be interviewed by humans. And uh, so you're in charge of it and you run it and you look at the pool of applicants and you say, oh, great, I've, we've got 50% uh, men and women. Perfect, and that couldn't be better. Um, you run it and it does its output and only 15% of the people it recommends for an interview are women. And you look at that and you're horrified and you say, this can't be right. And you take it to your managers and they say, no, this can't be right. Take a look at the data. 
and you say, well, I, I actually did check the data really carefully going in, but I'll take another look. You look to see if there's any information about gender and the like, and it looks like it's really good, clean data. And so somebody in your organization is going to say, well, then 15% is the right number. This is gender blind fairness, right? We, you just told us gender wasn't considered if this is the outcome, that's fair. Uh, many other people are gonna say, uh, they're gonna be really uncomfortable with that. And so you're gonna say to them perhaps, well, look, you know how this works, right? So that um, these machine learning systems, they're statistical and uh, probabilistic. So the way you get into the approved pile is that we set a threshold. We say, if the system in this case is 80% sure that you will uh, worthy of an interview, it'll put you in, whether you're a man or woman, 80%. And that's how we ended up with the 15%. But there are reasons to think that this might be unfair because of historical discrimination against women. So what we can do, I, what I can do for you as the developer and manager of the system is I can raise the threshold for men to get into the, that pile and lower the threshold for women. And if we do that, I ran the numbers, uh, we get a much better, fairer split between men and women. And some people in your company are gonna say, yeah, oh, that's, that's great. Um, and other people are gonna say, no, that's wildly unfair because you're now treating men differently than women simply because they're men. Let me be clear, I, I have my personal opinions about this, but I am not, they're irrelevant. This is simply another model of fairness and you may well disagree with it, um, but it is at least a plausible model of fairness. And a third, it gets more complex, um, uh, it says, you know what, let's take a look at the men versus the women who should have made it into the, into the approval pile, but the system simply missed them because it's probabilistic. And you do that and only 5% of men who should have gotten in were not, but a third of the women who should have gotten in were not. They were stopped because their, their worth and value was, was missed. And that is unfair. And some people are in the company are gonna say, oh yeah, no, that's right, that's unfair. And others are gonna prefer a different model of fairness. But as I say, not trying to argue for any of these, any of these, my point is that there are different ideas of fairness. Fairness is not simple. Thanks in large part to work done by machine learning uh, researchers, there's now at least six well-known, well-established models of fairness. There's another couple of dozen maybe that are in contention and all of them are plausible one way or another. They get very, very mathematical and very complex. So fairness turns out not to be simple because we now have to face, we have a tool that requires us to be so explicit about uh, how we specify what will count for us as a fair outcome. We're also developing tools um, this is uh, the what if tool. Uh, it's one of many, but it allows you to explore a model to see how it works in so far as you can. Um, one of the features of it is a fairness, set of fairness buttons that allow you to apply five different models of fairness to your model to see instantly how it sorts things out. So if you remember, uh, personal computers in the 1980s became a dominant technology because of a single killer app, spreadsheets, which allowed us to play what if with our businesses to change uh, a number here or there and see what happens if we hire 10 new salespeople and the like. And that was, and it still is a tremendous uh, tool. Now we are developing tools that allow us to play what if with fairness we've never been able to do that, at least not as fluidly and as easily. And I think this is actually a tremendous step forward, uh, both as a tool and as a reminder that fairness is not simple. It's something that humans argue about. It's complex and difficult. So in both cases, when we're looking at either uh, managing outcomes or applying principles, both of those approaches expose the complexity of the world, an existing complexity. It's not making the world more complex. It is revealing the complexity that we've been able to hide from ourselves. It re requires a, it does this by requiring us to grapple with that complexity as a design principle right from the beginning. So to change examples, if you were trying to design a traffic system for your city, not using machine learning, you'll have, we hope, uh, uh, vivid and, and strenuous conversations about what values you support, the values of com 
commuters, of pedestrians, of the rich part of town, the poor part of town, and so forth. Mass transit and, and all the rest of it. Those are difficult conversations. We're used to having them, they're very difficult conver conversations. We have, this is um, what we now have to do with most machine learning systems, any, especially any that touches the life of, of citizens. We need to have the same sorts of conversations and we desperately need to involve those citizens rather than having technologists decide what what makes for a good city traffic system using machine learning or what is a fair outcome uh, from a, a, a employee uh, application system. We need everybody who is affected by this, including people who are left out of these discussions and have been traditionally for centuries, if not millennia. This is participatory machine learning. I, I think it is crucial to the, the success of machine learning as a social um, technology. This means full participation in both the design and in the arguments over values, the discussions over values. The challenge I think is overall regu regulating what we don't understand without insisting on understanding it, without reducing it so that we can understand it. Because in some cases, not in all, in some cases when we reduce machine learning to what we can understand, we will lose some of the benefit. We will also uh, give ourselves a false comfort of thinking that we live in, in a world that can be reduced to control, always reduced to controllable, manageable sets of explanations and causes and relationships. But that's not the truth. The truth is, is complexity. This is the truth, not just of machine learning, uh, but of the world that we live in, which we can now address and acknowledge because we have technology that allows us to gain some benefit from it. Transparency is not an ontological property. Explanations are not a feature of the landscape, but messiness is. Messiness is the characteristic of the world that we live in. And we finally can address that and acknowledge it because we can benefit from it. We already are benefiting from it through technology that absorbs this messiness, outputs results, which we hope we can regulate into uh, it, fair, uh, regulate fairly, um, but results that are far more accurate and helpful than our old prior technologies um, in which we started with what we knew, we fed in meanings and assumptions and theories, and what we got out was both enabled by and limited by those theories. Now we have data and messy, complex data. So we're now able to acknowledge this. So in my opinion, I'm not a regulator. I'm not sure what I am, but I'm not a regulator. So I say this with, uh, with uh, humility, but here are three things I think that maybe regulators, um, what this means for regulators. It means, I think that you got to get close to the technology. You don't have to be a developer, but it helps a great deal to understand, have a vivid sense of how the technology works. And because this technology does not think the way we do, because it doesn't think at all, um, it requires, uh, I think, a fair bit of creative thinking. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that you all agree with this. Um, and the third is it needs to include everyone because we don't, well, for the obvious reasons that people's, people are going to be affected by the decisions made about which values need to be supported. And we are now forced to have those conversations because we have technology that is superb at, at, at making predictions beyond what we could do unaided. But uh, as stupid as a bag of frocks, because it's just, it's just a computer. It needs to be told with incredible specificity exactly what sort of results we want from it, what sort of results we think are beneficial uh, to everyone, and what sorts of results we think are fair to everyone. This, doing this, I think, will enable us to embrace this opportunity without having to limit it to what we can manage in our old traditional ways of managing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, David. Um, this was fascinating. Um, I, I think you have really highlighted some key issues and I particularly love the last slide. Um, you know, we need to get closer to tech. This is something we were discussing earlier, just the panel before. Um, we need to think creatively as regulators and of course to include everybody. Um, I'm, you know, you're a philosopher, so I, I want to bring it back a little bit to a question which is maybe more philosophical, 
But, you know, when I was listening, I thought, well, you know, transparency is something, yes, we are asking for, um, and it's very difficult, it's very complex. But, you know, is there, are there any areas we absolutely need to have transparency in, i.e. that, you know, not non-transparent systems will just completely not do? Yeah, and what's behind your question is a really important point, which is it, it is case dependent. It, it varies. We're talking about trust more than anything and the ability to uh, discover and repair um, offenses. Uh, so, transparency, uh, so transparency for weather prediction, um, there are times when we will want that, simple times are when it, it's going wrong and developers will wanna know exactly why it's going wrong and they will engage in forensic uh, studies just as inspectors of airplane crashes do. Um, there are also times when we may want to question the uneven distribution of data that supplies um, weather systems, um, which may favor developed nations over others, depending how many sensors and satellites are flying over your, your uh, area. But that's a place where transparency seems a little less urgent than, say, the use of machine learning systems in judicial systems. Now, in the United States, uh, we, I will express a personal opinion, we unfortunately um, have been using this, this technology in some ways in judicial systems that I think are, we should not be. Uh, the most famous example is the use of a particular machine learning technology to set bail we already have a horrendous and horrendously biased mail system and to suggest sentences. Um, judicial system, we really want people to have confidence in. It, it's more than anything else. Um, a judicial system could be totally just and everybody, if everybody thinks that it's not, then it's the society falls apart. Trust is really, really important. And that's a place where we may want to either not use machine learning systems or only use them in ways that uh, somebody who feels that he or she has been treated unjustly can ask for an explanation and count on getting one. We do this in the US with FICO scores, with scores uh, that represent your how worthy you are for credit or loans in which the data has to be, is constrained to what can be um, explained and um, and every score has to be able to be explained to you in a way that you can act on. And that makes, to me, that makes sense. So it, but it's very, as, as I say, it's very case dependent. In the case, if I were a patient and, and if there, in 10 years, the machine learning system has shown itself to be accurate in the way, you know, 72% accurate in, in its diabetes prediction, as a made up example, I would take that very seriously. I, without knowing how it came to its decisions any more than I really know how my doctor uh, maybe came to her decisions. Uh, Pavlina, I was just wondering if we have any questions in the chat that maybe you might want to share. Uh, yes. Hello, Dr. Weinberger. First, there are a lot of accolades in the chat about your speech. A lot of people found it very inspiring. And um, Vrix and Acosta would like uh, to point out that uh, one of the major points is not leaving anyone behind and is asking, what about the regulator who has tech, legal, educational, managerial, marketing background, and who considers to be a systems thinker and solution creator manager for the complex issues that may arise? What would be your take on their role? With regard to... Um not leaving anybody behind, that person may be in, has a set of tools that are useful in, in business for, uh, that is motivated, in businesses that are motivated to reach as many people as possible because, you know, for the obvious business reasons. Um, there, so I, I did try to em emphasize uh, the participatory side of it, but I, I left out in the interest of time. <laughs> um, it's really, I think it's really, really hard. I think it's, it's hard to find, it's, it's a wonderful aim and it's an important thing to say, but we don't, as far as I know, we don't yet have institutional means for doing this. Um, who do we include? Um, 
we, as far as I know, we don't have great ways of even deciding that. Now, it's, it's easier, in some cases, it's easier than others to find people who are at least in the sort of the first line of effects. If you are using machine learning to design a bus system for your city, and you simply tell it to be more efficient, it will come up with an efficient way of routing the buses, but you may discover that it does that at the expense of uh, driving down service in the poor parts of town. I'm making this up, but it's perfectly plausible. Um, so clearly you want, you should have asked people throughout the city what's important to you and taken seriously the voices of people who are more marginalized, who, who probably need the bus service more, what matters to them. Um, that part's relatively straightforward. It's getting the voices of people who are affected. Um, it's second and third, or, third order effects. Um, I look forward to the time when we have processes that are uh, good practices, standard practices, and, and reliable and, and work well enough. I don't think we're there yet. I would love to be wrong about this. But the very, you know, figuring out who needs to be at the table and making sure they're there and then figuring out what it means to be at the table. How do you actually act on their voices? Um, I think these are crucial questions. And I hope we'll, uh, we meaning everybody on the planet will be addressing these in repeatable ways. I think we have a few more questions actually. Maybe we have time for one more. Um, okay. <laughs> so Mike Nelson from Carnegie Endowment would like to know, uh, how might data unions or data cooperatives as envisioned by Alex Pintland and others at MIT help both protect personal data and make more high quality data available for all sorts of valuable ML applications? Um, hi, Mike. I think we know each other. If not, glad to meet you. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good question. I, I, I mean, I'm very excited overall, not just for machine learning, but especially for machine learning in the, in, in the interoperability of data and of models. We are, already have, I think, a pretty good model of this sort of interoperability in climate science where the, climate is the most complex thing imaginable, I think, on, on the face of the planet outside of human behavior, and maybe more so. Uh, multiple models, different data, multiple models, and then models that ride on top of those that try to make sense of the output of each of those models. Um, the ability to uh, federate models helps in all sorts of ways. The ability to make models interoperable at the data level or at the model building or at the outcome level is all tremendously, it's another evolutionary step forward in how we, how we do this. So I think it's a really, really promising direction. And uh, thank you, Mike, who I may know uh, for bringing this up. Well, thank you so much, David. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that even though we had this little hitch, we, we managed to, to really go through it. And I think we've really been on time. So thanks a lot. It was fascinating as always. It's really been a pleasure to have you here with us. And um, I really hope that the viewers and uh, all those you know listening to you were energized and could I, I, I think it was just very thought provoking and um, very helpful as well with the takeaways for the regulatory sort of landscape. I'm surprised and glad to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well, all the best. And, um, and I, we will now take a short break um, for, for those of you, please don't leave because right up after is going to be the preview sessions uh, with the ETH Zurich group. So I'll see you back at uh, about um, 5.45. So see you all there. Thank you very much, David.